Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sri Narayanan. I'm the CTO for IBM Payment Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our breakout session here at the Canada Payment Summit 2021 on the theme, The Future of Payments is Digital. In this session, we'll delve deeper into the subject of public cloud and why it is the only option for managing the pace of change in global payments. We believe it is inevitable that payments workloads will be deployed to public clouds. However, in order for that to happen, public clouds must provide similar and if not higher levels of assurance to clients on the safety, soundness, compliance, and resiliency. Earlier today in the keynote session by Expertus, the Canadian FinTech with global impact that's now an IBM company, you already had an opportunity to hear from their CTO on the hybrid cloud journey. It is my pleasure to introduce Manav Gupta, the CTO for IBM Canada, who will be the main speaker for the session. Manav will talk about specific capabilities in the architecture for IBM Financial Services Cloud, a public cloud that is purpose designed for the financial services industry to address the industry's requirements for cybersecurity, regulatory compliance, and operational resiliency. Before I hand it over to Manav to give us a strategic perspective on the financial services industry public cloud, first let me take a few moments to talk about what this all means for payments. After Manav's presentation, we'll then have a fireside chat. We'll then be happy to uh, uh, take questions from the audience. Payments industry is at an inflection point. Payment margins are under pressure for incumbents with new entrants, alternative payment options that are coming up with transparent pricing and utility service providers that are driving margins down. We're seeing a rapid pace of innovation through fintechs and new business models that are driving positive change in the industry while threatening incumbents. The accelerating rate of change in the technology presents both opportunities and challenges, opportunities for payments product differentiation and challenges just because of the competitive landscape, it also opens up. The challenge for incumbents specifically is that the payment infrastructure incumbents is aging. Such systems are difficult to adapt to changing market conditions and regulatory driven initiatives. The aging landscape or the aging technology landscape also means higher operational risk, paucity of resources for support of such an infrastructure, limited agility, and of course, rising costs that are collectively forcing changes in the way payment applications are designed, delivered, and operated. Further, digital payments are seeing increased security threats and potential exposures. Banks' cost to counter fraud continues to rise. Payments is a highly regulated business. Here in Canada, we have uh, Bank of Canada, Payments Canada spearheading modernization initiatives and scheme rule changes, and we've seen modernization initiatives touch all the payment rails, high value, low value, and instant. Uh, so FIs have to comply with regulations from multiple regulatory bodies, uh, not just Bank of Canada Payments Canada, OSPI, FinTrack, and of course, privacy regulations such as uh, PIPEDA. The initiatives that uh, Payments Canada is driving are specifically uh, you know, geared towards opening up the ecosystem, providing mo more open risk-based access, data-rich payments through ISO messaging standards, and in a sense, driving innovation in the overall marketplace. Given these challenges and opportunities, we believe that adoption of cloud delivery models and as a service models are an imperative. And we are already seeing increasingly that, that traction gain in the industry. These models can drive operational efficiencies through leveraging cloud qualities of service, such as consumption-driven pricing models, provisioning on demand, auto-scaling, and more importantly, leveraging higher and higher cloud abstractions, not just at the infrastructure at the platform layer, but as a at a service layer as well, function as a service, software as a service, and whatnot. On the last point of software as a service, and I would even call it as a capability as a service, we're seeing increasing availability of adoption of payments as a service solution, including our very own that we have deployed on IBM Cloud that is abstracting away core payments processing based on screen rules and relevant regulatory requirements, leaving the FIs to focus on delivering better digital experience for their customers and of course, driving competitive differentiation. The combination of the rapid pace of innovation we see in the cloud, the agility with which one can provision consume capabilities, the increased unbundling of the payments value system, where we are now seeing ISV, SaaS providers, FinTechs, Paytechs, that are essentially providing point capabilities within that value chain, is, is, is going to mean that, that there needs to be a, a more co-opetition model in terms of how payments capabilities are delivered and differentiated value propositions are delivered to the clients. All of this, of course, gives us the confidence, especially now that we are seeing this unbundling happen and we are seeing increasingly these um, you know, payments capabilities being delivered on cloud. 
it, it gives us the confidence that public and industry clouds will become an option for managing pace of change in the payments industry. In fact, it will be a major catalyst for managing the pace of change in the payments industry. Yet with that promise, we also see that less than 20% of financial services workloads have progressed to public cloud payments, even less so. And why is that? And this is due to a lack of standard industry-focused risk-based approach to security risk reduction and regulatory compliance. Controls definition required by each FIs uh, is passed on to cloud service providers, ISVs, and SaaS providers, making it very complex and costly to manage overall. In addition, I talked about the whole unbundling of the payments value chain. Well, that's, that's, that's obviously a very positive thing in terms of how payments capabilities are put together and delivered to the clients for better experience and, and to lower costs and of course bring more innovation. The reality is as you look at these capabilities being delivered on the cloud and especially on different cloud vendors, you as an FI uh, have to manage complex costly digital supply chain risks. Not just FIs, but even that's the case for even payment service providers that they have to now manage the uh, digital supply chain risk that arises as a consequence of such a model. And this is what is driving the emergence of what we call industry clouds. And we have our own financial services cloud that are purpose designed to address the scale, resiliency, cybersecurity, and regulatory compliance requirements, and more importantly, industry specific risks. Uh, and towards ensuring that they are adopt uh, adapted to the cloud delivery models um, so that um, the financial institutions or payment service providers can essentially adopt cloud delivery models with confidence and assurance of safety and soundness. So that said, uh, I'd like to now uh, pass on to my uh, colleague, Manav Gupta, who will give a much deeper perspective on Financial Services Club. Thank you, Sridhar. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here. So look, I have a very simple message, and that simple message is, as financial institutions, go on their journey to cloud. Almost everybody is building their same uh, controls, control objectives, their DevOps pipelines, the DevSecOps processes, etc. And as they begin to leverage the public cloud, there is a need for a simple, easy mechanism to achieve consistent and continuous security and regu regulatory compliance. There, there are two ways of doing so. One is that each organization tries to do it by themselves, or perhaps there is a industry offering such as the IBM FS Cloud that makes it easier to do that. So in the next about 10 minutes, I'm gonna walk you through what IBM FS Cloud is all about and how it helps financial institutions enable their security posture in this in this in, in a public cloud environment so that they can they can uh, put in their most sensitive of their workloads. So that said, if I take a step back, so the adoption of cloud and using cloud for a wide variety of services, it's nothing new. If I was to draw the Venn diagram of the financial services institutions and the fintechs or ISVs, et cetera, they're all trying to do more or less the same thing, right? Both sides want to innovate with speed. They have to modernize and transform for the financial services and institution side. On the ISV side or the SaaS provider side, they want to make sure that they can lower the cost to harden um, their um, offerings for each FI's security controls. And then there is things in the middle that are common. The easiest one of those is, of course, build and manage applications across the hybrid multi-cloud. But the next two are the ones where, where the rubber hits the road and where things get really messy. So how can the financial services institutions or the ISVs and the third parties and the SaaS providers, how can they have a consistent, easy to demonstrate and prove security and compliance posture, one that um, conforms to the various regulatory jurisdictions and can satisfy the CISOs from the various organizations, which leads to the final point, which is how can they have how can they secure sensitive data with the highest level of assurance possible? And that's, I would submit to you that that's what IBM's FS Cloud is designed to do. So it, this thing started as, as, out as a concept about two years ago, starting with Bank of America. And really the intention there was to come up with a mor model which provides the security of the public cloud in a public cloud environment. So that gave birth to IBM FS Cloud. So the idea behind FS Cloud 
is that is a it is a secure enclave on top of the IBM public cloud. So wherever IBM public cloud is available or the multi-zone regions are available, including the one in Toronto, the FS cloud will be layered on top of that. So in the middle here picture, in the middle of this picture where you see the IBM cloud framework for financial services, that framework is a set of policy controls and regulatory uh, controls that are baked into the guts of the cloud so that whether it is the bank's own applications or workloads or the third party ISV workloads or the SaaS workloads that we are onboarding as part of our ISV validated validation program, they all conform to the same standard compliance and regulatory framework. So when it comes to the CISOs um, having to review the cloud controls for them having to uh, approve whether the cloud is ready for use or not, there is an easy mechanism to do that validation of controls or for third parties uh, to do the validation or an assessment of those controls. At the heart of it, the key elements of that program are as follows. So number one, so everybody that I have spoken to and the number of clients in Canada that we're talking to that are investigating this right now as we speak, they're all interested in trying to find the exact same thing, which is um how are how is ibm building that ecosystem or how is ibm building that controls framework so number one thing that we did for that is we built th that controls as a framework and the controls that framework that we're building is informed by a number of clients so we, we created a consortia um so, so we created a consortium that enabled our clients to um to inform what that ecosystem should look like what the framework should look like there is, there is a set of compliance as code, automation as code, and, and security as code that is being implemented. So that forms the, uh, the basis of the intelligent monitoring and enforcement. We are also leveraging some specific capabilities on our cloud around um, which provide us some differentiated capabilities such as mainframe level data security, uh, compute and, and network isolation specificities, specific capabilities around that that allow us to demonstrate how we can how we can provide that level of compliance into the guts of the cloud. And then finally, we have created a global innovation lab, which helps the FIs connect with our IBM research team in order to build that portfolio of skills and capabilities for them to, to consume this cloud. So that's the net net of what IBM FS Cloud is about. If I dive deeper into this, so that's the three layer picture that, that was there previously. So at the heart of IBM FS Cloud, and in particular, the framework for, the, for that financial services cloud, at the very bottom is the IBM Cloud public multi-cloud public cloud multi-tenant services. So whether it is uh, compute on demand or open shift on demand, um, storage, block file storage, et cetera, managed databases, et cetera, all of those public multi-tenant services they have been architected in a way, along with instrumented in a way, so that the secure architecture can be demonstrated at all levels, IS, PaaS, and the data services. Um, if necessary, the FIs can consume uh, additional capabilities from our global services unit. So that's the, the underlying layer. On top of that, there is a set of validated ISVs and SaaS providers, and I'll show you the list in a second of the ones that you're working on along with IBM's own applications and some third-party applications that we're onboarding. So the idea here is that any FI that wants to consume that, there is a, there is a groundwork or there's a framework of controls that, that, the, that all services on the cloud already comply to that they can, they can consume. Any third-party applications that come through that validated ISV program, they will already be validated to those same set of controls. And then finally, the third layer, is a single dashboard or a compliance dashboard, as we like to call it, which is available as a service on IBM Public Cloud. And additionally, we can augment that with our promontory uh, unit, which, which works with several jurisdictions around the world. So fundamentally, that's what FS Cloud is doing. So uh, delving slightly deeper into what the security and compliance center look like, look, looks like. So in IBM Public Cloud, for the financial services framework, you can define a set of rules. So those rules are effectively based on each workload. So if you were to think of the end-to-end um, -end, um, development and compliance um, lifecycle, so from the point that a developer checked in the code to 
Uh, so, so, so doing the code scanning, vulnerability scanning, to deploying of the code, the infrastructure as code deployment, making sure that all of the uh, security policies are enforced, and, and then feeding back into a single um, single standard dashboard. So that's what the security and compliance enterprise is. This framework is continuously adapted um, and, um, and improved over time with the various regulatory authorities and jurisdictions that IBM works with. Um, I briefly mentioned the bunch of financial uh, services um, vendors that were into this validated program, or what we also call the ecosystem. So there's about 90 odd um, ISVs into this ecosystem um, across various different use cases. So the intention behind this is, again, building a set of workloads that, IS, that, that FIs can come in and consume, so, and, and such that the controls posture the um, the evidence um, um, as as well as any of the uh, process and security governance capabilities etc are all being delivered in a uniform manner. So that's the intention behind that. Um, how do we actually do that? So IBM acquired a com company called Promontory a couple of years ago. Promontory works with several jurisdictions around the world. So for example, in North America, we work with FFIEC, FDIC, obviously OSPI in Canada, um, etc. Um, in the UK with uh, Financial Conduct Authority, um, EBA and uh, GDPR in Europe, et cetera. So the idea here is that that all of all of those regulatory authorities and the various and the various standards that they have, they inform the meta security and compliance framework. That meta framework gets translated into actual implementable controls that we implement as part of the um, FS uh, as part of the financial services cloud. Number of those controls will be obviously active controls. Some controls might be remedial controls. And finally, there might be a subset of controls that are actually policies. So those policies might have to do with how does the how does the how do the disks that fail get discarded after after a, a device has been uh, terminated by a client, as an example. So what Promontory does is on an ongoing basis, they provide um, they provide updates to this uh, th this control framework, and they partner with all of those authorities that, uh, that I talked about in order to continuously keep this framework updated. So bringing this uh, into Canada and making it uh, applicable to Canadian regulations as one example, so Promontory has identified three primary Canadian regulatory agencies. And looking at all of the legislations and the requirements, obligations, guidelines by all three, so OSPI, AMF in Quebec, and the Canadian Cybersecurities Regulation, we identified about 296 odd obligations. Um, and you know, I have an assessment listed out here, so 152 by OSPI, another 127 by AMF, et cetera. The interesting thing for me as we started actually implementing these things as code is only about 10 to 20% of these obligations had to do with InfoSec. Bulk of these obligations had to do with outsourcing and party and contract risk and business continuity. So it's a very, I'll say almost a humbling exercise in, in some way in understanding the full spectrum of compliance that FIs have to adhere to. That said, suffice to say, we have internalized that. We are building these controls as we speak. So when FS Cloud in Canada becomes available later this year, any workload that any FI puts into FS Cloud will be able to enjoy the same instrumentation that we're building in into our own framework. So you can extend that framework into the workload that you bring on in, in order to get the validation done in a uniform manner. So I'm going to end here. So here is, a, here is the overall integrated approach for our FS Cloud. So at the very bottom, the detailed control implementation, that's all of the DevSecOps control implementation that I talked about. Uh, they, they veer off into two parts. So you'll obviously have some runtime control implementations. So And those runtime controls vary across different technology areas, whether it is network security, identity and access, so on and so forth. They are informed by the security and compliance posture. Um, and on top of that, we provide you mechanisms to integrate this with the enterprise policies and the GRC system that any, any organization will have today. So this is available for consumption today, uh, both for VMware workloads as well as for cloud native workloads are driven by, on OpenShift as the basis for that. The support for Canadian 
uh, legislation is still being built that's going to be available later this year so that's the intention behind that uh, there are a number of tier one banks in canada that we are working with they are in various stages of of investigation deep dive and validation of those controls um, and the general consensus is out of the box we have very high coverage for the way each of those fis is doing um, controls validation today um, as much as 97 98 percent in most cases and then turns out that the delta that we generally have is not a gap in the framework, but it generally is around interpretation of what that regulatory obligation should look like in terms of whether it's a security policy or whether it's an actual act of control or a remedial control that an FI has to have. So Sri, I hope that provided a quick bird's eye overview of what IBM FS Cloud is about and how the FIs can, can use it to their advantage. So with that, I'm going to pause and I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mano. That was uh, certainly quite uh, quite an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I do have a couple of questions for you. The first one I want to start with right, is right at the beginning when we talked about the controls framework. Uh, tell us a little bit about you know what's the process that uh, VIBM went through in terms of developing the controls framework. I mean, the need for that industry standard controls framework and the need for developing that collaboratively across the industry and with the regulator. Uh, tell us about the process we went through specifically in the US and of course the work we are doing with uh, regulators in Canada as well. Sure, let me take a step back. So a couple of years ago when we started this journey with Bank of America uh, and not just with BFA, but in general with the various FIs that IBM has been working with, what became apparent is every, every FI has a set of cloud control objectives or CCOs that everybody's been working on. The, or the implementation of those CCOs, some clients call it their control plane, some call it part of their DevSecOps pipeline, et cetera. So originally it seemed that for every um, public cloud and then for every ISV and then every SaaS that FIs consume, they have to go through that validation all over again. So the approach that we took, starting with BFA, is leveraging Promontory. We we developed a meta library of controls, which and 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 looking at that meta library, what became apparent is there is a meta set of controls that is applicable to every FI, regardless of where they are in the world. There might be some, I'd say, local differences in terms of how the evidence is expected by the various regulatory authorities, but largely speaking, that the interpretation into technology was more or less the same. So that was one point. I think the second thing then was, when we started working with FFIEC, FDIC, et cetera, in just understanding the, the possibilities of interpretation of, what the, of, of those controls. And turns out there's a finite set of how you can interpret a control. So as an example, the control might be that the bank should have, or the FI should have, um, uh, if I should have um, adequate controls for workload isolation. Now, there are only so many different ways that you can isolate the workload. So the approach that we took in building the FS Cloud was number one, we started with that meta framework of controls. We translated those frameworks, those controls into how many of those controls are specific to the public cloud at the IS layer itself. And then on top of that, for each of the managed services, we started adding additional controls on top. And then finally, you need some kind of a dashboard to help you visualize those controls. So if I take a step back now, you know, fast forward two years, where we are is there is about 500 odd controls that we have, or control objectives that we have. Um, some that are into deep into the guts of the cloud in terms of how we are, you know, for example, um, you know, things that determine how we are disposing of the disks once the disks are dead, as an example or things we're ensuring around, do we have the right level of access and security controls that when the operators that come in to operate IBM Cloud, are they being governed and controlled the right way? So I'll say those are, so some are cloud specific, some are policies. And then and then you, you have the third set of controls, those that I'm gonna call active controls. And the active controls could be preventive controls. So ensure that any public cause uh, cloud object storage bucket is, is not publicly available, anything that gets provisioned. Another example of a active control might be ensure that 
any images that go into a container registry, OpenShift or other Kubernetes registry, whatever, they all are built on a base image, whether it is Red Hat Enterprise Linux or any enterprise approved uh, 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 base image, et cetera. So what that, so, so that's the active controls. And, and then you can have, then we have another set of control that's the, um, I'll call it the media controls. So developer comes in through the pipeline, they have provisioned some capability. At that point, you wanna make sure there is some ongoing review of that infrastructure or the services that have been provisioned. You identify any potential security risks or compliance risks, and you provide a mechanism to report compliance or lack thereof. Right. And in some cases, we might actually do um, active, um, you know, uh, remediation of those controls. And then the most most nefarious ones or the most difficult ones to implement, obviously, are the ones that are, those are around policies and standards. So when the when we talk to the FIs, when we work with the FIs, the bulk of the time goes into working with the CISO organization and the risk organization within the FIs to determine if if a certain obligation is, a, is around compliance, but if a certain obligation is, is a policy or a standard, how would we implement it jointly? And more importantly, how would we provide the validation of that to the FIs? So I hope that kind of gives you the idea of how we went about doing that. Yeah, absolutely. And just to kind of add layer on that same question. Uh, so, you know, controls implementation is one thing at the FS cloud layer. And to, you, you talked earlier about the security and compliance center, the point of which is to really provide the ongoing evidence of compliance mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the support for regulatory driven audits, for example. So could you talk a little bit more, elaborate on the uh, the need for that type of ongoing security compliance center that provides the evidence of control implementations um, for the purposes of regulatory audits and of course also for the purpose of monitoring compliance on an ongoing basis, not just the initial implementation of the controls. Yep, I think that's a great question. And I mean, really the ongoing validation of controls against, well, ongoing validation of the workloads against the controls is really at the heart of FS Cloud. So I'll, I'll break that down into two parts. So one is doing the ongoing validation of those controls. And the second is providing a single pane of glass or a dashboard in which to visualize those controls. So the guts of the FS Cloud is this policy framework that provides us the set of controls. Um, in some cases, our clients have already built these type of controls themselves, whether it's their config rules or their security policies, et cetera. So we provide those policies via profiles or scopes that you can run in our cloud. And so for example, for, I don't know, let's take NIST 853 or NIST 800-160 for container security as an example. Here's a set of controls that if you're provisioning, if you're provisioning containerized workloads in a public cloud, here are the areas where, uh, from from according to NIST, best practices for the type of security um, obligations that an FI should have. So we provide those things, those type of we, we provide mechanisms to provide those to perform those checks, quote unquote, out of the box. So. Clients can come in, they can configure a scope, they can pick that that's the set of policies that they want, and those controls get implemented against their workload that they have running on, on the public cloud. The next step then is surfacing that into a dashboard so that you, it is available on an ongoing basis. So there was a graphic that I was showing there, which was uh, that, that I shown in my deck, which was a security and compliance center, and that does exactly that. So you can run that scan periodically. I think right now it runs about once every hour or, or thereabouts, and you can configure it to run on an ad hoc basis as well. So as developers come in, when I've provisioned my infrastructure, I'll have some active controls. Then on an ongoing basis, there is periodic assessment of those controls and updating of the dashboard. If I can trigger that update or that validation of the controls on an ad hoc basis as well, in case I'm concerned of a, of a new, CVE that gets uh, you know you know uh, reported, so so that's that's essentially the idea. Got it. Sounds great. So, so the next question I have is around the digital supply chain risk. So at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned about uh, how that's becoming increasingly an area of concern, especially given the unbundling of services both in the core banking and the payments world, where we are seeing uh, capabilities in the value chain of the ecosystem 
now being delivered by multiple parties. So for example, in the case of payments, be the payments acquisition versus the actual core payment processing versus the adjudication of payments in terms of fraud and, and uh, you know AML sanction screening and whatnot in terms of fulfillment of the payment itself. And of course, the clearing and settlement to the back end rails. Um, so when you look at this kind of unbundling and you see uh, you know, market players now actually providing capabilities uh, that uh, are essentially constituents of this sort of value chain. Um, and you now have essentially uh, a, uh, you know, a customer, whether it's a FI or a payment service provider that is potentially consuming a myriad of these capabilities that are being delivered through different cloud delivery models, not just one cloud, but even multiple clouds. How do you ensure that uh, digital supply chain risks are, you know, managed? What is the approach that, uh, um, you know, we've taken as an example in the in the FS industry cloud to address or mitigate di digital supply chain risks. Well, um, I, I think that's another great question there, Sri. So, I think our approach with the FS cloud has been to identify working with working with. So, so, so number one thing that we did was we created a client advisory council for FS cloud which has representations from tier one banks across uh, around the world. What that council has allowed us to do is identify what would be sort of the core or the key third party workloads, ISV workloads that we should target as part of the digital supply chain. What we've since done is we have now partnered with about 100 odd such ISVs and we are working with them going through the exact same process that I just talked about of, of controls validation and controls assessment with the idea that by the time, so as we are onboarding those ISVs onto FS cloud, so now the cloud is one element of the, of the, of the digital supply chain. The past services that they're providing is yet another, the ISVs that are running their applications is yet another element of, of that, of their digital, digital supply chain. All of those three elements, would be subjected to the same set of controls and the same CCOs. So when an FI comes in to consume a workload, rather than have to do the controls assessment and validation for the full spectrum of controls, it'll be a very small subset of controls that they have to work with. So I'll give you an example. So there was one of the FIs that we're working with in Canada right now. If they, what we eventually discovered is if they were to go well, in, in today's world, then when they each each ISV or SaaS uh, property that they onboard, there is about 280 controls that they have to validate every single time. What we determined as part of the due diligence is if they were to consume those ISVs and if those ISVs were already existing on IBM FS Cloud, the burden of the controls that they have to validate goes down from 280 for every ISV down to 35 every single time, right? So that's substantial improvement in the number one, the time to value, obviously the risk, right? And improved security posture, the reporting is being done in a form and in, in a form manner in a uniform, you know, and, and you know, both in terms of time, in terms of format, et cetera. So I hope it kind of gives you the idea of, of what we're trying to do yeah. within, the, within the DSP. Certainly does, and it's good to hear that we have, uh, you know, scaled down what I would think is a, you know, a, uh, um, you know, a, a summarized list of controls that uh, the ISPs and SaaS have to onboard uh, or have to comply with, because that could in itself become an impediment to adoption otherwise. So it is striking that balance between ensuring uh, the security and compliance of these workloads as they onboard to industry cloud versus, of course, you know, ensuring that it's not becoming onerous exercise. Um, the last question I have before we go to the audience is more around uh, how we support the onboarding. So for instance, uh, while this sounds great that you know there is a common controls framework and there's 280 plus controls and whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, this may come across as an onerous exercise, necessarily so because these are critical workloads, mission critical workloads and sensitive workloads, but given the time to value, time to market you talked mm -hmm. about, what does that onboarding journey look like? So we can onboard clients, um, you know, to, towards actually taking advantage of, you know, the, the capabilities and more importantly, being able to transition these workloads uh, fast uh, in a fast and safe and secure manner. So how do we ensure that while uh, striking that balance between 
uh, ensuring all the controls are in place and and they are of course you know uh, there's there's basically uh, they've been implemented sufficiently etc cetera, etc cetera, right yep hey it's it's another great question so in terms of the onboarding process what we typically will do is we'll start by doing a controls assessment of any fi's um, controls of framework or the ccos that they have today we'll overlay that on what we have and then we have a uh, so that's the first part of the assessment. That assessment will generally kick off some kind of a validation. Either we do it, or there are some third parties that we can engage, consulting organizations that we can engage in, or, in order for them to do the validation on behalf of the uh, of the FI. There is, in fact, um, a capability that we're working on that we call the pooled audit. And the idea behind that is rather than have, rather than spend weeks and weeks of person hours to do that validation, There'll be a pooled mechanism by which very quickly the FIs can establish that, hey, if, you know, here's the validation that Bank X did of the controls and here's what it looked like. They can very quickly use that uh, to, to arrive at their own assessment. But beyond that validation of the controls, what, what also ends up happening is a detailed um, exercise around mapping off the FS cloud into that client's ecosystem uh, with their DevOps pipeline. So that becomes part of really more around onboarding. So how would they start consuming it? Uh, what kind of controls framework or and beyond what they already have, what they look like, um, et cetera. So all that to say, there is a defined mechanism by which we do it, right? So we start by assessing what their controls look like. We'll overlay our framework on top of what the FIS controls framework looks like. Uh, we'll have more detailed validation exercise that we go through, and then we start thinking about how do we, how do, how do the clients integrate their DevSecOps pipelines into FS Cloud? Broadly speaking, that's the, that's the idea. Yeah, we, I was saying we could probably talk hours about this, Mano, because this is a very interesting topic and and one that I think is very pertinent. As we spoke in the beginning, um, if you were to have uh, in our you know in our view, we see public cloud as the option for managing the pace of change, and for us, uh, it's 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 quite clear that to manage that pace of change on public cloud, you need to that guarantee and assurance that public cloud can run these workloads securely and more importantly, provide the framework to comply with regulatory obligations. And so it's, uh, I think from that perspective, the work on industry clouds is something that we all need to watch for. And I think is one that will be uh, pretty critical for, to drive uh, or, uh, the, or accelerate the pace of uh, you know, adoption of, for moving our payments and core banking workloads into the cloud. So with that said, I do want to now move into some audience uh, Q&A. So let's uh, see if there are any questions from the audience. Um, um, feel free to ask us any questions. We've got a little bit of time here, and we're happy to answer uh, questions you have. And of course, uh, post the session, we'll be happy to uh, connect one-on-one -on, -one on brain date as well. OK, so there's a question here. Uh, the question is around uh, examples of how FIs are adopting FS Cloud and the specific value they're deriving from FS Cloud adoption. Example, reduction in compliance costs, accelerating a workload transformation, et cetera. So, Manu, could you address that? Sure. Uh, uh, and I think it's both, right? right? So, so, so cer certainly a reduction in compliance costs is one element. But beyond that, um, acceleration of the, of the workload transformation or cloud adoption, that's generally the number one factor. Um, other areas around um, trying to innovate quicker, faster. So uh, the cloud might have some native services that it provides that might be not be not that might not be that easily available on prem on premises. Um, but broadly speaking, that's kind of the category that I see. Yeah. Are there? Could you give us some specific examples of some of the use cases that you're seeing in terms of uh, you know workload transformation to uh, FS Cloud? Sure. So what we have started seeing, in fact, is um, business critical applications that typically, historically, we would have seen that hey, they're never going to leave the world, they're never going to leave the data center. Uh, clients have now started, especially if it's a message-based application. Uh, in some cases, existing uh, legacy applications, ten plus year old applications, which are the plain old, plain old Java objects, Pojo type of applications that are now being rewritten um, as uh, as uh, lambdas or, or function based um a few few months ago we introduced this capability called code engine so we are seeing that being used quite extensively um as well 
so yeah, I mean, it's a full spectrum of, of use cases um, that we're seeing our clients uh, adopt these days. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. Um, I think from a payment standpoint, I'd say that, uh, you know, we ourselves are working with various ISVs that, uh, you know, are essentially certifying on FS Cloud. In other words, they're going to offer their services as uh, FS Cloud certified services. Uh, again, to provide that assurance and confidence to clients that uh, they can consume services that are already complying with the controls framework and the regulatory obligations and whatnot. Uh, same goes for um, you know our cloud services. Many of them are essentially getting certified as FS cloud services, meaning that they go through that certification process and ensure the compliance with the uh, applicable controls as well as jurisdictional regulatory obligations. Uh, we've got as well many of our offerings, and I'll speak very briefly about our payments as a service offering. That's uh, that is one that we are also certifying, in the, uh, or have a plan to certify on FS Cloud as well. Okay, hope that answers the question. Um, okay, here's another question: What are FIs responsible for when it comes to security and compliance on such industry clouds? In other words, I think the question is really around the shared responsibility model, which is uh, you know. Given that the FS Cloud essentially would, or an industry cloud such as FS Cloud, would be responsible for uh, controls, you know, uh, for all the layers of the cloud, such as your IaaS, PaaS, and CaaS, and function as a service, and even SaaS, extending to SaaS offerings on on FS Cloud. What would be an FI's obligation in terms of uh, controls that they may need to specifically implement as they are looking to move their workloads to FS Cloud? Yeah, so I think it's a great question and one that requires a bit of a nuanced thinking and, and, and answer. So I'll answer it this way. The design point of FS Cloud is that, that it should be as easy to consume as if it was a public cloud. Now, there are certainly additional controls that it is providing that may not be provided traditionally provided by our cloud provider, let's say. So the intention here is that for FIs to consume those controls as if the public cloud or IBM FS Cloud was an extension of their own data center. So the way you would be doing your reporting today um, and providing evidence to the regulatory authorities, that doesn't change. And in, in other words, IBM FS Cloud becomes another provider for, for that evidence to the, to the uh, re regulators. That said, there is a well-defined responsibility model that we have um, put together. Um, it's no different. It's not fundamentally different, I'll say, compared to how things exist in the public cloud world. There might be there might be a separation of duties that increases up further up the stack you go. And what I mean by that is, when it comes to controls that are baked into the IIS layer, you'll probably get a bit more controls because we as a provider have more control over our public cloud. When it comes to the PaaS layer, certainly on our cloud, with the PaaS services that we're providing, we, we can enjoy um, providing you more granular controls at the PaaS layer in addition to what we provide at the SaaS, at, at the IS layer, et cetera. So this will require, I'm afraid, a bit more detailed conversation in order to determine uh, de 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 determine that, that responsibility model and where the separation of duties lies. Yeah, absolutely. I think maybe the, the main question here is, um, you know, besides the fact that FS Cloud essentially uh, or industry clouds bake in these controls and, and regulatory compliance requirements at different layers of the stack, when an FI is moving their workloads over, or a PSP or, or a FinTech is moving, or ISVs in this case, could be moving their workloads over, what specific areas of concern they would have, besides, of course, ensuring that they are complying to the uh, and following the prescriptive guidance around the controls that we implement are there specific areas they focus on it seems to me i think from what you're saying there'll still be some obligations especially around things like data access security because if it's at an application layer that the um you know the isv or the SaaS or even nfi is managing managing access to the application itself is one area where you might have things like identity access management that uh, you know, they may need to be concerned about. Again, there are cloud services for identity access management, but technically it'd be a FI responsibility to define sort of the roles and role-based access controls and so on and so forth. So certainly data access security, I see as one that uh, would uh, be one that, uh, you know, the consumer of such FI, FI, FS cloud services would still need to be concerned about. Okay, so I'm going to go uh, and, and to our last slide, which is going to talk a little bit about the payments as a service, uh, you know, offering we have. And I just want to share some details around it in terms of you know um, how that takes advantage of some of the capabilities you've talked about from an FS uh, cloud perspective. Um, so 
Manav actually walked us through what some of the capabilities are from an industry cloud standpoint, essentially the common controls framework, the uh, collaborative way in which these controls need to be developed uh, within an industry context, collaborating with industry players, with the regulators, with the standards bodies, et cetera. And of course, the uh, ongoing uh, evidences of such compliance and the, um, uh, you know, uh, and of course, a mechanism to monitor continuous compliance. Those are all aspects that uh, Mana walked through. And those are quite critical as you're moving mission critical workloads to, uh, you know, uh, cloud providers. What I want to really briefly talk about here is uh, a payments as a service platform that we've deployed on IBM Cloud. And this essentially is a, a SaaS platform. And what this does is provides as a service payments processing capabilities for all payment types, and whether they are high value, low value, or instant or whatnot, um, including, of course, the um, you know uh, payments payment types such as uh, checks. Um, this model, essentially, what we've done here is really try to take take an advantage of the cloud delivery model in the fullest extent. For example, I talked about things like uh, provisioning on demand, cloud consumption model. I talked about auto scaling, et cetera. So what we've done is really taken advantage of those cloud qualities of service to deliver a platform that is essentially born on the cloud. Um, and what it does is provides, as I said, a um, consumption-based model for payments processing. Um, it uh, provides essentially open ISO 222-based APIs for uh, clients to access these payments capabilities, uh, essentially provides payments processing uh, with all the jurisdictional specific scheme rules and regulatory obligations baked in to, to the platform with the result that from a client perspective uh, or consumer perspective, they are free to focus on more on their uh, payments product differentiation and of course on delivering richer customer experience and digital experience to their customers. And what we have done here is to take advantage of the cloud delivery model and all the things that uh, you know uh, Mana talked about in terms of leveraging the um, underlying sort of uh, controls we have in the cloud, whether they be regulatory or in terms of security and whatnot, and of course the scalability and resiliency capabilities of uh, the cloud delivery models as well. Um, essentially, what uh, if you look at the uh, consumption pattern here of how the consumption works, you know the clients can consume these capabilities via either an API or more traditional batch based batch oriented model. Essentially, batch oriented model would applicable, for example, would be applicable, for example, for things like AFD payments um, or check payments in general. But having said that, the platform essentially shields consumers from having to worry about uh, scheme rules, having to worry about the uh, back-end integration with clearing and settlement rails. And really what it does is opens up that ability to consume payments processing essentially on a per transaction sort of model or on a con consumption-based consumption -based model. Um, so this is a great example that, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, I want to offer here for the kinds of capabilities that one can um, essentially deploy to an industry cloud. I mean, this goes to the heart of payments is what I'm showing here. But obviously, as I said, you know, when you look about the payments processing end to end, you can think about various un, you know, capabilities that are part of that value chain. And really the, the, the industry cloud such as IBM FS Cloud offers you a really a secure, resilient, um, and, and a regulatory compliant environment to you know, move and run these workloads with confidence. And that is exactly what I'm trying to illustrate here uh, with the payments as a service platform that we've deployed on IBM Cloud. So with that, uh, I'll stop here and uh, see if there are any more questions. Um, we'll give a couple of more minutes to see if there are any more questions. Um, and of course, feel free to join us uh, on at the brain date. Happy to have uh, sort of a one-on-one -on -one discussion as well and address any, any, any further questions uh, you might have. And you might see in the chat that uh, if you want more information about the IBM Payment Center and the payments as a service offering that I briefly discussed, you can uh, visit us at the uh, URL link that is provided in the uh, room chat. Um, as well, I think uh, uh, we have as well a, um, um, a, a uh, an article and a point of view that has been published that you can also access at, uh, is basically on the future of payments. Um, and the link is as well on the room chat. So feel free to access that as well. And we'll look forward to uh, your feedback. Okay, it looks like there aren't any more questions. We'll still stay around for another couple of minutes, but thanks everyone for joining. Hope this session was useful, enjoyable, and uh, you know, hopefully you got some insights on industry clouds, and uh, we certainly look forward to further engagement with uh, 
with all of you and look us up on uh, brain date happy to uh, hang around there and happy to answer any 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 follow on questions thanks very much Thank you.